All right. So, we're on to discuss your project is our task for today. Because we've talked about design for a couple days now, a couple classes. I don't know what is going on today. Oh. Jeez. I'm not awake this morning yet. Uh, we talked about the design of a web page, and we came to some conclusions. We talked about, first of all, the, the fundamental principle that we're talking about is that a, a good web page is one where the user can achieve their goals. We're going to add to that that the organization can also achieve their goals. Right? Um, a band might have a website, and if they gave away free music to everyone, that might achieve the user's goals, but that wouldn't, one, wouldn't help the organization achieve their goals. So, the user achieved their goals and the organization achieved their goals. That is sort of the key to good web design. <coughs> and we said that the Visual elements, I want to write aesthetics, but I'm not sure I can spell it, aesthetics of the website, ought to support those goals. In other words, the things that we add to the website, such as color and fonts and all that, We'll make the website look better, but on a more important level, they're going to support the goals. They're going to support the goals by providing emphasis to things that need to be emphasized, by showing content that is the same, content that is different, um, let people know at a glance what the structure of the page is. I've heard it said that, you know, uh, if you take, uh, well, I have glasses on, but those of you that don't have glasses, um, if you kind of like, blur, you know, step back and blur your eyes a little bit, you should be able to still sort of understand the organization of a page even without reading the words. And you do that through what we talked about last time, or what, what I was describing as visual language. So, where does that leave us and where does that leave us for our project? Well, we started last time. If we're going to talk about the, the user achieving their goals, we have to know, first of all, A, who are the users, and B, what are their goals, and C, what are the goals of the organization. So, that's the process that we're going we're to go through in designing a website. We're going to start at that point, and we're going to move to a completed website, and sort of along the way, we're going to think about visually, what's the visual language that we're going to employ to support that? So, your project is broken down into five phases, the project design that you'll turn in. So you'll turn in a document, a Word document, and maybe some related files that will contain five sections. And these are strategy, scope, Structure, skeleton, and surface. All right? Easy to remember, they all start with S's. So I want to talk about what's in each phase of this design for these different sections. 
and what your document's going to look like. Now, I have uploaded to Angel a sample document that I did. Let me pull that one up. In the semester project section, all right, we have a few documents. Here's the sample plan. We'll look through that, then we'll go back and we'll look at uh, the rubric. Actually, we can look at both of these at the same time. I'll only spend a few minutes talking about these because I know you've all read those. Okay. Look to see if I got any laughs. Sometimes in classes when I say that, I get a couple chuckles like, oh, he thinks we actually read these, but... I, you know, I guess I shouldn't assume. All right, so the strategy phase. All right, we're going to define goals for our users and goals for the organization in creating the site. Now, as I mentioned before, goals should be goals that are specific to the content of the site and not just simply restating basic web design principles. In other words, don't say, a goal of mine is to have a site that has great navigation. People aren't going to be visiting your site to be awed by how good your navigation is. People are visiting your site for some actual content. So, those kinds of things shouldn't, don't really count as goals. So what are you going to have in this section? You're going to have a description of your site's topic purpose. And when I say that, I'm talking about very broad terms, just sort of to, to uh, you know, sort of uh, summarize in, in a nutshell what you're creating a site for. That will include a bit about probably who your target audience is. You know? It's very difficult to be all things to all people. So it, the example I give is about jazz music, right? Uh, my sample plan that I've created. If I tried to make a site about jazz music that addressed every possible person who could be visiting my site, from an expert musician to a child in grade school, it'd be very difficult to design a site for that. So you have to sort of hone in on who your target is and, and what their goals are. So, it's one thing to say I'm going to do a site uh, about jazz music. It's another thing to say I'm going to do a site about jazz music that is a reference for musicians, um, professional musicians. All right, That would be one maybe possibility for a site. Or another might be for middle school kids. All right, And so on. Have a prioritized list of three goals for the project. And I say your goals, I mean sort of your organization's goals. Now again, most of you are probably just going to make up a topic to, to, to do this on. You're not going to actually do a website for an organization. But assume that there's some organization creating the site and, and identify what the goals are of that organization. A prioritized list of the three user goals for this project. All right, And create three user personas. The user personas are what we talked about last week, where we go further than simply describing the users in very broad terms, and we actually make up fictional people that are hypothetical users for our site. And we talk about certain characteristics of them, and we talk about what kinds of things they'd be interested in, and what their background is, and so on. Now, you might think that that's just kind of a dumb, hokey idea, corny, what's the real reason for it? But it seems to really help people put themselves in the mindset of another person to actually make up a little story about someone, about fictional people. 
Uh, and again, I'm not saying you have to write their biography or anything. I'm just saying write some characteristics about it. So that is the strategy section. And if we look in my sample, here's my strategy section. I have my overview. All right. And I state a few things that most people aren't very familiar with jazz musician, uh, uh, jazz musicians. And my aim is to create a site that people that don't know a lot about jazz can visit and learn more about the great musicians that play jazz. It will be geared towards listeners, not musicians, and novices as opposed to experts. So I've really narrowed my subject down quite a bit. All right. As opposed to simply saying that I'm going to do a website about jazz, which the audience could run the range from a professional musician to a child in elementary school, I've narrowed it down to people that are listeners of music, so not necessarily musicians, so I'm not going to talk about like tips to select an instrument or anything like that. And I'm talking about novices as opposed to experts. So I'm not going to go and, and write detailed analyses of music. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to write in, in more general terms, uh, meant for the average listener as opposed to someone that's an expert in the field. So that's the overview part of this. I've defined my goals as an organization. My goal to broaden uh, the popularity of jazz by educating people not familiar with it at all. To expand listeners' horizons by introducing them to musicians about which they are not familiar. And to give an overview of the whole history of jazz. All right. So this helps me, again, narrow the focus. So I'm not just talking about music of the past. I'm not necessarily just talking about music of the present. I'm talking, I want to talk uh, and touch on the whole history of it. I want to, uh, again, get people familiar with stuff that they're not otherwise familiar to. Goals one and two sort of relate to that. My user goals include find other musicians similar to musicians they already like, to find biographical background information about jazz musicians, and to get information that will assist them in building a jazz record library. Now, I will say, you want to make your goals as specific as possible. And sometimes it's not possible to define really real specific goals. Um, but the more specific you can make them, the better you can look at your site when you're done and say, did I achieve these goals or not? When I'm done, I should be able to look and say, did I help people build, if people use my site, will that help them use a uh, build a jazz library? And so on. So that is the strategy section. Again, oh, I'm sorry, that's not the whole strategy section. I missed the personas. The next part is the personas. The personas is where I defined my three personas. So I have an actual picture of a guy that I got out off of Flickr, licensed with a Creative Commons license, which means there's no copyright issues using this image. And I make up, and this person, Brad Parker, listened to jazz music growing up. His father was a fan. He stopped listening. Now he's getting older. He be, he's becoming interested in it again. Mary Nelson is taking a music appreciation class at a community college. She knows almost nothing about jazz, but does enjoy some of the music she hears in class. She needs to get some information and doesn't know where to begin. All right. And finally, Bob Jones has a few friends that listen to jazz music. Over time, he's picked up some contemporary jazz artists that he enjoys and has become a fan of contemporary jazz, but he wants to find out about some of the historical musicians. So, that part from here, the overview, to the goals, to the personas, constitutes the first section of the page, or, or first section of the design document, the strategy section. All right. I can show you how I'm going to grade this. Oh, I already opened up that document.
the strategy section. If you don't have one, you get zero points. That kind of makes sense, right? Incomplete or vague, complete and professionally defined. I'm looking at this, I'm wondering if this is the most up-to-date scoring on this, because I think that adds up to 20, and I think this is only worth 15 points. But anyhow, I believe it runs from zero to three points, not from zero to four points. <laughs> so that's the strategy section. And again, that is one of the most important sections of your document. All right, because it really sets the stage for everything else. You define the audience that you're creating the website for. When you're then thinking about and trying to make decisions about how to lay out the site and so on, you go back and you think about and you try to place yourself in those people's shoes and say how are they going to view this information? What kind of stuff would appeal to them? And so on. Again, can you narrow down a group of people into simply three Templates, of course not. All right, people are individuals. Each person coming to your site is going to have their own background and their own story. But it's better to sort of think in terms of three common types of people that are going to be visiting your site than to simply talk about the user as though that there was one kind of user that was going to visit your site uh, and uh, you know had, there's one set of goals that people are going to have and, and so on. All right, so you do that as sort of a narrowing process to sort of help you focus on what's really important in the site. Now, um, actually, if I was doing this over again, if I was doing one of these, I'd probably start with my personas first because my personas will help me dictate what my goals are. All right, if, you know, if, I, if I think about who's going to be visiting LC's website. You know, I'll think about faculty, I'll think about current students, I'll think about prospective students. Well, then I can say, well, what are the goals of faculty? What are the goals of prospective students? And so on down the line. Now, we're doing a relatively small website, so I've arbitrarily picked three goals for each. But again, in a larger website, you certainly would have more than three personas and more than three goals uh, for the users. You could even have a list of goals for each persona that you define. The second section is the scope section. Or another way to say the scope section is the requirement section. The requirement section is where we look and we look for specific pieces of content that will help our users and help our organization achieve those goals. All right? So, maybe one of our organization goals is to reduce the number of phone calls. Again, not talking about the jazz example, but maybe talking about the, the, the college example. Maybe the goals of the college in creating the website is to reduce the number of calls to simply find out things like what's, uh, you know, what events are going on at Stocker Center this week. You know, it, when you call that, you know, people have to take the time to answer the phone and all that. If you can provide that on the web, then people can look that up anytime. They don't have to only call between 8 and 5 or whatever. So that might be one of the goals to, to alleviate a lot of people calling in uh, and asking questions. Well, what are some things that might help doing that? Well, maybe a frequently asked page, a uh, frequently asked questions page would help doing that. Maybe a calendar of events would, would help that, and so on. So in the requirements or scope phase, you think of specific requirements that support the goals of the user and the organization. All right? Now, for any goal, there can be several ways to achieve that goal, right? Let's talk about, again, a, a band making a website. All right? A band making a website 
might, one of their goals might be to attract new listeners. All right. There's a lot of different ways that a band could attract new listeners. Right? They could put 30 second samples of their songs on a page. So they could have a list of 10 songs, 30 second samples of them. All right? Or they could allow people to download one song for free. All right? Here's the song, download it, listen to it, and so on. Or they could allow their music to be streamed on the site, but not downloaded. So you can hear some of their songs, but again, you wouldn't be able to download them and put them on your iPod or whatever. Or maybe they could have links to YouTube videos of performances or, or whatever. Those are all different ways, different pieces of content that, that they could put on their site that would achieve those goals. So in the requirement section, what your job is, is to decide what specific pieces of requirements, what, what uh, specific pieces of contents you're going to put on the website to help support those goals. Now, one thing to keep in mind, again, is you don't want overkill. So a gut reaction might be, well, let's do all those things. Why not? Well, when you start adding a lot of stuff to your site, you get clutter. Um, it makes it harder for people to find things. A lot of bad things happen when you go in and, and you, you start, uh, start with the overkill. So that's why you would look at your user goals. You'd look at the goals of the organization and decide what the best way is to achieve those goals. What content can you put on the site to achieve those goals? All right. This is where the goals of the organization and the goals of the user um, need to be balanced. All right. You know, thinking of the band example, you know, users would want as much as possible for free. So if I was a user visiting a band I like site, the ideal situation would be for me to be able to download every note that that band has played for absolutely free, right? But that's obviously absurd. The band's goals, and I'm sure there are many goals, but as far as the selling of music goes, the band's goals will be to, you know, make money by selling stuff. I'm sure that's one of the goals of the band. Obviously these two goals conflict with each other. So in de defining what requirements you're going to have and what the scope of this site is, you would have to sort of decide where on this line you're going to go to sort of balance out the need of the organization and the needs of the users. In other words, to use the old Venn diagram, the organization has goals, the user has goals, and there's some common ground between the two. You want to find some sort of common ground between the two, and that's where the content for your website comes from. All right? That's where the website of your con uh, that's where the content of your website comes from. If you only address the user's goals and you don't address the organization's goals, the site won't be successful. All right? And the flip side is true as well. You know, if you only address, address the organization's goals, but you don't address really the user's goals, then no one will want to use your site. So you sort of have a balancing act and you sort of have to find what's in common and that's where you create the content. The requirements section of the document is a list of pieces of content that are going to be in the site, but in no particular order, all right, and with no thought given to the organization of them. So it's essentially like a brainstorming session for what are all the things that we want to have on the site. So in my example, I say 
that we're going to have biographies of contemporary musicians and jazz masters of the past. Each biography will consist of general information, a description of the musical career, a description of the playing style, a description of or a list of musicians that influenced this musician, a list of musicians that this musician's played with, and so on down the line. One or two audio clips, links to Amazon for one or two best recordings, and a way to link to that biography from anywhere else on the site. There will also be an index of all the musicians on the site, and finally, there will be a page for each of the main instruments to be used. And on each page, the biographies will be arranged chronologically. So again, the requirement stage is really a brainstorming session where you think of all the pieces of content that you're going to have on the site. And you list out in simple declarative statements the stuff that you're going to put on your site. And in this phase, again, you don't really think in terms of like organizing it. The organizing it sort of comes later. All right, the organizing it, organizing the content on the site comes on a later stage. Now, we can make a couple of observations about how goals and requirements correspond with each other. We've already said for every goal there could be potentially many different requirements that we could put on the site that would support that goal. All right? But we can also apply this rule and we can say that every goal should have at least one requirement that addresses it. And we can say the opposite as well. Every requirement ought to address at least one of our goals. There's not necessarily, though, a one-to-one -one correspondence. So in other words, for one goal, you might have three or four requirements, three or four items that you're going to put on your website, and all three of them address a given goal. And that's fine. If it's an important goal, you're likely to have a lot of content that supports it. But the flip side is also true. One requirement might address two or three goals. One requirement that you put on the page might address um, several goals. So for example, on a college website, if I put a calendar of events, that may address the user's goal of being able to find out, a community member's goal of being able to find out what the cultural events are on campus. It may also um, address the organization's goal of alleviating the number of phone calls that come in. And, and swamp people that work in the Stocker Center or something along those lines. All right? So, every goal should have at least one requirement. Every requirement should have at least one goal. If you think about it, that just makes sense. All right? If you've defined something as one of the most important things on the site, but you, there's no content that addresses that goal, then you've missed the boat, right? There, there's stuff that you need to add to your site. If I say that this thing is one of the most important things on the site, but I'm not going to put anything on the site to address it, that's not a bad, or that's not a good situation. The flip side is true as well, though. All right? If I'm going to, if I plan on putting something on the site, but it doesn't relate to one of the goals, then you might as well get rid of it. Right? Because it's, it's probably not that important. All right? So, we want to make sure that the goals and the requirements are very tightly matched. Now, one thing that I suggest doing, and I didn't do in my example, but one thing that, that 
is helpful with that is going in and actually matching up the goals and the requirements. So for example, this first goal of the site having biographies of both contemporary musicians and historical musicians of the past. That actually addresses definitely addresses O3 and I would say it addresses O2 as well. Alright. And it would address the user goal 1 and user goal 2. So what you can do in your diagram is go in and actually put the number of the goal next to the requirement. Now I didn't do it here. That's not an absolute something that you have to do on the design document, but it can be very useful to make sure that what you've defined as your top goals are addressed. So I could say that this requirement addresses user goals 2 and 3 and organizational goal 1 and organizational goal 2. So it's not uncommon to have one requirement meet many or help address several goals. All right. That simply means that it's a very important piece of requirement, a very, poor, very important piece of content to have on your site. It's, it's a very important requirement. So it's not uncommon for that. So when you're done defining all the requirements, if there's a goal that you're not addressing, either one of two things, either that goal really isn't that important and you should get rid of it, or there's more pieces of content that you need to put on your site. There's more requirements that you need to add. If when you're done you have a requirement that doesn't match up to a goal, then maybe rethink putting that requirement on your page at all. Maybe that's something that you simply don't need on your site and if you put it in there that will simply clutter things. Alright? So, we have our goals which are in broad terms what the user and the organization wants to achieve through the site. We have our requirements or our scope section where we define a list of things that's going to address those goals. All right? But it's done in sort of a very brainstorming fashion with no thought of how we're going to organize stuff. Just a list of things that we're going to have on the site. The next step The structure step is where we start and start breaking down our site into pieces. All right, breaking down site our site and the content into different pieces into different pages, and the output of this is a structure chart, which kind of looks like an organizational chart with an organization, but typically it's going to start off with a home page and then it's going to have pages underneath the home page. And you could go deeper as well. You could have pages underneath those and so on down the line. All right. Now, for th there's several different ways that this can be organized. A hierarchy is probably the most common, especially for smaller sites like the ones we're doing in class. <laughs> so I chose to divide the topic by instrument. So I'm saying I'm going to have a home page, and I'm going to have a trumpet page, a saxophone page, a piano page, a bass page, a drum page, an other page, an index page, and a links page. All right. Simple hierarchy. Now, this organization makes sense, but don't think that there's only one way that you can organize content. Because I could have organized this a bunch of different ways. All right? I could have went and said, instead of organizing it by instrument, which I decided to do, I could divide my content by era. All right? So I could have my home page. 
I could have a pre-1920 page, a 20 to 1940 page, a 40 through 60 page, and a 60 to the present page. And then underneath that, maybe underneath this I divide by instruments, trumpet, sax, piano. I could have defined it that way. All right? And that's a reasonable way to define content. You know, I'm sure if you went and looked at textbooks about jazz music, you'd probably find this kind of organization in many of them, where it would break down by eras as opposed to that. All right? I could also break it down by stylistically. New Orleans jazz, maybe. Big band. Bop. Cool. Modern. And so on. I could do it that way as well. And then I could possibly subdivide each of these in there. All right. Another way that might be interesting will be divide things geographically. All right, reasonable. Early jazz, a lot of early jazz came up through New Orleans. Chicago, New York, Kansas City, California, Europe and Asia. My point is, is that all of these organizations, all of these ways of organizing this content are reasonable. But our challenge is in deciding what the best way of organizing the content is. So, when you're deciding how to organize the content, don't simply think of one way and say, I'm going to do it that way. Think of other ways you could do it, and then decide what's the best for your particular project. Now, how do you think you're going to decide what the best way of organizing your content is? What's going to help you in, in deciding that? Number one, well, number one is you, you could build prototypes. Um, and we'll talk about prototypes in a second. So you could try it a couple different ways and see what makes sense. That's, that's a good answer. What's another way? And again, some of this depends on the organization, right? If you were writing a, this for a giant organization, a website, you could actually build a couple prototypes and bring people in and, and test that and, and see, get their feedback uh, and all that. Or you could look at how other people have done similar sites. You could look at how other people have done similar sites, both in terms of does it make sense, does it work, or gee, this doesn't work particularly well, it, it doesn't seem logical. All right. The other, those are great suggestions. The other thing I would add to that, though, is when you're viewing it, don't look at it from what makes sense from the organization's perspectives, but view it what makes sense from your user persona section, uh, uh, perspective. All right? So, let's think back of these different ways of organizing it, and let's think, and let's view it from the persona's perspective. As far as era goes, as far as organizing a site by era, like I have here, 
All right. There's a couple problems with that. First of all, what would I do about a musician who maybe started playing in the 1940s and is still playing today? Where do they belong? Do they belong in the 40s through 60s category? Or do they belong in the 60s to present category? <laughs> uh, that's true, but there's a lot of great musicians that started in the 40s that are still playing. <laughs> so, uh, Sonny Rollins, Wayne Shorter, they're both probably pushing 80 if they're not 80 already. And, uh, you know, they, hey, they're, they're, you know, maybe some health problems, but they're still going strong. Uh, but, but, again, you know, okay, what if some of these started in the 20s and still were programming in the 40s? You know, you have that same problem. All right. So it might not be apparent where to put people. And for novices especially, that's going to make it hard to find. Let's say, for example, someone read an article about Sonny Rollins, who's a, a, a musician that started in the 40s and is still playing today. And they read an article about him today, so they still they look, at him in the, look for him in the current era, but you've decided to categorize them in the 40s through 60s, and they're not able to find them. That could be a potential problem. The other thing is, what if a, someone knows about music that they've heard, but they don't really know what era it, it belongs to? You know, gee, I like Duke Ellington, all right, but when was Duke Ellington around? Well, I don't know, you know. Was he pre-1920? Or was he in the 20s or 40s? And, uh, you know, it's hard to say, all right. So I decided that for novices, for who the site is geared, that the error really wouldn't work. All right? For similar reasons, I decided that my style wouldn't work either. All right? In other words, I can't expect a novice to know about, you know, what it means, you know, what's the difference between bop and cool jazz. All right, they knew that, they probably don't need this site, right? They, they, they could probably go to a site that was more geared towards expert listeners. So I decided to categorize by instruments. And my rationale is, well, you know, I might like nice piano music. I might like the sound of a trumpet. I might like saxophones. Or I might know a musician, you know, uh, Dizzy Gillespie, and I've heard him, and it's obvious if you've heard him for a second that he plays a trumpet. So it would be easy to find him. It might not be obvious like what era he comes in or what the name of the style is, but if you ever heard him play, you know he plays the trumpet. So therefore, I could easily find them, and even a novice could easily find them. Now, the point is, and the point I want to draw from this, is that there are a lot of ways that you could organize the content in your site. All right? But we just don't want you to pick away the first way that pops into your head. I want you to think of and consider a couple different possibilities and then justify why you picked that one. So that's exactly what I do in the Oops. That's exactly what I do in the structure section. I identify how I'm breaking down my site and how I'm categorizing all that information that I defined up here in the requirements and then I decide how I'm going to break that down into different pages, and then I justified why I did that this way. I'm going to introduce the last two sections to you, and then we will uh, talk a bit more about this next time, and then we'll start talking about, well, how do I go from this document to a completed website? The next to last step, the skeleton step, is where you decide on the basic layout of the pages. And again, for a simple site like we're going to have, 
most of your basic layouts are going to look the same. You have a banner, you have a navigation, and you have some content. Now you might choose to put the navigation going horizontally or maybe your banner doesn't go the width of the screen or whatever, but with a simple layout, most of yours are going to look very similar. And here I've shown a couple sample layouts of what my pages are going to look like. The last step is something that I didn't do in this document because we're going to kind of talk about that separately. And this is where we have an actual prototype. That is where we actually take and create a draft version of our final website. Think of the prototype being like a rough draft that you'd write for a term paper, right? Your rough draft, not everything is perfect, not everything is polished, not everything is finished, but it's a good starting point and you can go off on that and complete it. You know, why do you make a rough draft? Well, you make a rough draft, one of the reasons is to show other people, right? You know, if, if you're working on a paper, um, you could write a rough draft and show it to your teacher and your teacher could look at it and make suggestions. You develop a prototype for similar reasons. In fact, you develop this whole document for similar reasons and we'll talk a little bit more about that next time. But one of the reasons that you develop the document and the prototype is you could take it out and show it to people. If, for example, Lorain Community College hired me to create a website about jazz, if they did, I could go and show this to maybe the different jazz professors and get their view and, you know, does this look like a good website? You know, does it look like it's going to help the users achieve their goals and so on down the line? So, a long description, a long wordy description can provide some content, but people really get a sense of what the site's going to be about by actually putting their hands on it and playing with it and interacting with the prototype. So I suggest that, that you build prototypes for your sites and we'll talk a little bit more about this next time. Are there any questions about this process? It's pretty straightforward. I provide examples. I certainly am willing to look at what you're thinking about and what, you're, what, you know, what start you have on this and, and give you feedback. The one thing I will say is we have not talked about how to do things like this in the layout where you have the navigation on the side and the content over here, but we will very shortly. So when you're designing your page, don't be concerned and think, well, I don't know how to do that, so I'm not going to design it that way. You will know how to do that very shortly. So um, we'll work through that part of it. All right, any questions? All right, we'll see you up in lab.